on the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Jonathan Evans has a story about a security agreement between China and the Solomon Islands. Ana Mateo brings us words and their stories. Dan Friedel and Susan Shand have this week's education report. John Russell and Mario Ritter Jr. bring us a story about the future of the COVID-19 vaccine. And Brian Lynn reports on the first complete map of a full human genome. But first, here is Jonathan Evans. A security agreement between China and the Solomon Islands has raised concerns in the South Pacific Ocean area. Some nations worry the deal could launch a buildup of China's military there, threatening neighboring countries. The Solomon Islands government said an early version of its agreement with China will be cleaned up and signed soon. The early version was approved last week. The draft agreement was leaked online. It says that Chinese warships could stop at the islands. It also would permit China's armed police and military to protect Chinese projects on the islands. And the agreement says China must approve what information is shared about joint security plans. The Solomon Islands is home to about 700,000 people. The nation changed its diplomatic relations from Taiwan to mainland China in 2019. The move was rejected by many in the country and was one reason for violent riots last November. Both China and the Solomon Islands have strongly denied the deal will lead to the establishment of a Chinese military base. The Solomon Islands government said the agreement is necessary because of its limited ability to deal with violent uprisings like the one in November. But Australia, New Zealand, and the United States have all expressed concern about the deal. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern described the agreement as gravely concerning. David Panuelo is the president of nearby Micronesia. He wrote a letter to Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manassas Ogavari asking him to rethink the agreement. He noted that both Micronesia and the Solomon Islands were battlegrounds during World War II. I am confident that neither of us wishes to see a conflict of that scope or scale ever again, and most particularly in our own backyards, Panuelo wrote. The Solomon Islands police minister answered on social media. He said that Panuelo should be more worried about Micronesia being destroyed by the ocean because of climate change. Sogavari has called foreign criticism of the security agreement insulting. China's foreign ministry spokesperson said the agreement aims to maintain the safety of people's lives and property and does not have any military overtones. I'm Jonathan Evans.
now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Rain can be annoying. It can stop you from doing activities outside. So it is easy to complain about rain. Of course, rain is important, especially for plants. Although rain might seem annoying, it helps flowers and other plants grow. There are some periods of the year when it rains more than other times. In some parts of the world, for example, the month of April can be especially rainy. That brings us to our expression for today. April showers bring May flowers. This weather expression states that heavy rains help flowers to grow. Here, showers mean short periods of light rain. As a verb, shower can mean that large amounts of things fall, are given off, or happen at the same time. For example, you can shower someone with praise. That means you say a lot of nice things about someone. But now, let's go back to our expression, April showers bring May flowers. If you hear someone complain about all the rainy weather in the spring, you can remind them that April showers are helpful. This is a literal meaning of this expression, but it also has a deeper meaning. April showers bring May flowers means that even after long periods of adversity, good times will follow. Adversity means difficulty and hardship. In English, there is another saying that means about the same thing. Sometimes we simply say, this too shall pass. This means that difficult situations will not last forever. Now, let's listen to two friends using this expression. Hey, I haven't seen you in months. How's everything going? Well, okay, I guess. <sighs> you don't sound okay. What's wrong? The company where I work had to cut back. So, I've lost a lot of hours at my job. And both my parents have been sick. So I've been taking care of them. I'm sorry to hear that. Sounds like you're having a tough time. It will pass. I keep telling myself, April showers bring May flowers. That's a great attitude. Hey, how about if I make my famous chicken soup for your parents? That would be great. Thanks. See? The May flowers are starting to bloom. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. an anonymous report began to spread among Canada's university system. It accused six professors and employees at Queen's College in Ontario 
of lying about their ancestry for personal gain. Queen's College is currently overrun with white Canadians making false claims to indigenous, especially Algonquin, identity. The document reads, as a result, it said, the six were getting special treatment from the school and should be dismissed from their positions. The report also said that there were other college employees who falsely claim to be Native Americans, although it did not name any. The college rejected the accusations, which led to wider protest. A group of 100 Indigenous scholars quickly condemned Queen's College in a written statement. It said the school employs whites presented as indigenous professionals who claim both trauma and healing that never belonged to them. It argued that the school should require evidence of such claims, saying some are based on a single old family story or less. The scholars criticized the school for permitting such people to gain from lying about their ancestry and experiences. The protest letter demanded that Queen's College and all higher education centers establish ethical employment guidelines. It said they must include a process to confirm the ancestry claims of job seekers. The problem does not stop at the Canadian border, Native Americans say. In 2015, Dartmouth College learned that the director of its Native American program was not a member of an officially recognized tribe. The college dismissed the worker from that job and placed her in another. University of California professor and book writer Andrea Smith has said she is Native American for many years. Her claim has been debated for almost as long. The New York Times wrote a long story about Smith and the ancestry issue last year. In 2021, reporter Jacqueline Keeler began investigating people who claim to be indigenous. Keeler, a Native American, says she has identified about 200 people she suspects are frauds, people who say they are something that they are not. Keeler works with tribes, historians, and researchers to uncover truth in claims of Native ancestry. The team examined ancestral evidence from as far back as the 1600s. Then Keeler produced a list of names of professionals who, she says, falsely claim to be Native. VOA examined the list, which includes artists, writers, actors, and many university workers. VOA is not publishing the list as it cannot independently confirm what it reports. Some people have criticized Keeler for leading a witch hunt but she has strong support in Native circles. Outside of university life, many people have tried to profit from false Native American identity. That is one reason Native Americans try to fight against frauds. One well-known actor, Iron Eyes Cody, often played Native Americans in movies and television programs from the 1950s to the 1980s. He was actually Italian-American. In the U.S., tribes are considered independent nations that have the right to govern themselves. Most require proof of ancestry to join a tribe. Admission may require knowledge of the tribal language, culture, and history. Native Americans say that people considered frauds often make up stories about their ancestors.
In March, the University of Michigan began an online discussion about frauds in media, arts, politics, and education. It was called Unsettling Genealogies. Kim Tallbear, a Canadian professor, took part in the event. She raised special concern about frauds who become well-known in their professions. She said, some become thought leaders who help the government make policy. David Cornsilk is an expert on the Cherokee Nation. He said the issue is damaging public trust in universities. University employers must be willing to investigate people they are considering for hire, he said. In March, the National Indigenous University Senior Leaders Association, NIUSLA, and the First Nations University of Canada, FNU, held an online discussion. Organizers called on attendees to explore the best ways to validate identity claims. FNU president and NIUSLA co-chair Jacqueline Ottman said the process of self-identification is not working. She offered what might prove a simple solution. Ask university job seekers for permission to investigate their backgrounds. It may become more difficult for some people to claim indigeneity, but these processes will ensure that um, Indigenous uh, peoples are rightly identified and, st and stepping into these uh, positions. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Susan Shand. Scientists say they have finished mapping the full set of genetic information for human life. The effort involved the first-ever sequencing of a complete human genome. A group of international researchers announced the result on March 31st. The researchers said the latest sequencing work filled in all remaining information needed for a full map of the human genome. The research was published in a series of studies in the publication Science. A first version of the research was published last year before it was examined by the scientific community. In 2003, scientists released what was described at the time as a complete sequence of the human genome. But the international research team said the earlier effort did not include about 8% of the genome. The past failure to complete the full map was linked to limitations in sequencing technology in use at the time. Evan Eichler is a researcher at the University of Washington who took part in the latest effort. He was also part of a past research effort known as the Human Genome Project. Eichler told the Associated Press that some of the genes that make us different as humans were contained in what he called the dark matter of the genome. He said the earlier sequencing efforts missed those parts. It took 20-plus years, but we finally got it done, Eichler said. 
Many people, including Eichler's own students, thought the full sequence had already been completed. I was teaching them, and they said, "Wait a minute, isn't this like the sixth time you guys have declared victory?" Eichler said. He answered, "No, this time we really, really did it." Karen Miga is a genomics researcher at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She helped lead the latest research. Miga told the AP that scientists hope the results will open the door to new medical discoveries in areas such as aging, the nervous system, cancer. And heart disease. The human genome is made up of about 3.1 billion DNA chemical base pairs, known by the letters A, T, G, and C. The National Human Genome Research Institute explains. Each of these base pairs are contained in 23 pairs of chromosomes found in the nucleus of human cells. Each chromosome contains hundreds to thousands of genes. The genes provide instructions for making proteins, the building blocks of life. An estimated thirty thousand genes make up the human genome. Until now, Miga said there were large and persistent elements missing from important areas of the human genome map. So Miga worked with Adam Philippi of the National Human Genome Research Institute to organize the team of scientists to start over with a new genome. The group's goal was to sequence all of it. The effort added new genetic information to the human genome and corrected past errors. It also identified long stretches of DNA known to play important parts in both evolution and disease. I'm Brian Lynn. Into the COVID-19 pandemic, United States health officials are discussing how to best protect Americans from the ever-changing coronavirus. On Wednesday, a group of vaccine advisors to the Food and Drug Administration spent hours debating questions about changing vaccine shots and doing future booster campaigns. They did not reach any exact decisions. The questions facing the experts included: How often should vaccines be updated against new strains? How effective should vaccines be to get government approval? Should vaccine updates be coordinated with international health authorities? The FDA recently approved a fourth shot of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines for anyone fifty or older. And for some younger people with severely weakened immune systems, the move is part of an effort to get ahead of another possible surge. But the FDA's vaccine chief, Dr. Peter Marks, said at the meeting, "We simply can't be boosting people as frequently as we are." He called the latest booster update. A temporary measure to protect Americans, while government officials, 
decide whether and how to change current vaccines. One area where experts appeared to agree is that vaccines should be judged on their ability to prevent severe disease that leads to hospitalization and death. Dr. Mark Sawyer of the University of California, San Diego, said, We need to focus on the worst case, which is severe disease. By that measure, the current vaccines have held up well. During the last Omicron-driven surge, two vaccine doses were nearly 80% effective against needing a breathing machine or death, and a booster pushed that protection to 94%, federal scientists recently reported. But only about half of Americans eligible for a third shot have gotten one and many experts say it was not the best idea to continue asking Americans to get boosted every few months. An expert from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggested that the 80% protection from severe disease could become the standard for vaccines. I think we may have to accept that level of protection and then use other methods said Dr. Amanda Cohn, CDC's chief medical officer. Presentations at the meeting by government health officials and independent researchers explored the difficulty of predicting when the next major COVID-19 variant might appear. Trevor Bedford of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center said a major new strain like Omicron could arrive anywhere from every 1.5 years to once a decade, based on current data. All three COVID-19 vaccines now used in the U.S. are based on the original coronavirus that appeared in late 2019. Updating the vaccines will be a difficult job, likely requiring communication between the FDA, manufacturers, and international health authorities. To get the vaccines to market quickly, the FDA used shorter ways to judge effectiveness, mainly looking at the early vaccine effects on the immune system's antibody levels. A number of experts said they wanted better data from studies that follow patients over time to see who gets sick or dies, but that approach would likely take too much time. Dr. Ofer Levy of Harvard Medical School said, it's going to be hard to generate all the data we want in short order when a new variant emerges. The process for updating yearly flu vaccines offers a possible plan, as laid out by a representative from the World Health Organization. Twice a year, WHO experts recommend updates to flu vaccines to target new strains. The FDA then brings those recommendations to its own vaccine panel, which votes on whether they make sense for the U.S. But COVID-19 has not yet fallen into a predictable pattern like the flu. And as the coronavirus evolves, different strains may become stronger in different parts of the world. Several experts said they would need more meetings with more data and proposals from the FDA to decide on a plan. I'm John Russell. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.